Well, as we begin our time this morning, brethren, I want to read just two verses that have been on my mind as I have been seeking mentally to frame my opening prayer this morning. Unto you do I lift up my eyes, O you who sit in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their master, and the eyes of a maid unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look unto the Lord our God. Is the servant and the maid looking to the hand for hand signals, where to go, what to do? Or is it rather most likely the hand is the instrument of provision? And the servant and the maid have every right to believe being the property of their master and their mistress, that it's the master and the mistress who take care of all of their temporal provisions. That goes with the place and the privilege of owning a slave. You commit yourself to provide, and God in grace has made us his bond slaves, and with that, We have God's promise, he that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So let's take the posture of servants before the master, looking for his open hand this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that you've accommodated yourself to us in our limited ability to grasp spiritual realities. And we thank you for this psalm and for the imagery of the slave who looks to the master for the provision of all of his needs. And we gladly take our place as the willing bond slaves of Christ this morning. And we look up to you and to your open hand remembering your promise that having spared not your own son, you will with him freely, that is, as an act of abounding grace, give us all things necessary to accomplish your redemptive purposes in us. And Lord, we need the Spirit's presence to illuminate our minds to impel our wills in the direction of obedience to your word. And so we look to you. Open your hand, we pray, and give us this morning all that we need. Hear us, we plead, in this our corporate prayer, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, it hardly seems possible, brethren, but uh, counting, it is accurate to say that we come this morning to this 12th session in this sixth unit of our pastoral theology lectures. And in this hour, I purpose to complete my dealing with the lectures on the subject of cultivating the gift of public prayer. Now remember precisely where this subject fits in the broad scope of our present area of concern, namely the work of shepherding, overseeing, caring for, leading, and governing the flock of God. Remember Whitmer's division of the macro shepherding and the micro, and we are concerned with the macro shepherding, those dimensions of shepherding responsibilities which apply to the church in its corporate life. And having established from the scriptures how vital is this subject, looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we then descended to consider guidelines from the scriptures with reference to our ordinary services of worship and then to those special services of worship, the Lord's Supper and baptism. But in all of those services, you and I are called upon to take the lead in the prayers of God's people. And therefore, I judged it to be vital that we park on this subject of our public prayers and the fact that we ought to have a holy passion to cultivate our gift 
of public utterance or utterance in public prayer. Having established the importance of this subject, we were then dealing with general guidelines, and I said that there would be six categories of those guidelines. First of all, I address the fundamental intention of our prayers. When we say, let us pray, what are we about to do? And we must have a clear concept. We are seeking to be the mouthpiece of the gathered people of God. We are seeking to stand on their behalf before the living God at the throne of grace. Then I took up with you the essential content of our prayers Thirdly, the linguistic form of our prayers. And now we come in the fourth place to consider guidelines with respect to the vocal patterns of our public prayers. And again, I'll state these guidelines in terms of things that we ought to avoid with respect to the manner in which we use our voices and our vocal powers in our public prayers. And I have five brief words of avoid, avoid, avoid. Five words of counsel, all couched, beginning with the word avoid. Number one, avoid like the plague, assuming a praying voice, which is qualitatively different from your normal speaking voice. John Newton had encountered this in his own day, and I'm sure we've all encountered it in ours. He writes, the tone of the voice is likewise to be regarded. Some have a tone in prayer so very different from their usual way of speaking that their nearest friends, if not accustomed to them, could hardly know them by their voice. Sometimes the tone is changed, perhaps more than once, so that if our eyes did not give us more certain information than our ears, we might think that two or three persons had been speaking by turns. It is a pity when we approve what is spoken that we should be so easily disconcerted by an awkwardness of delivery. Yet so it often is and probably will be in the present weak and imperfect state of human nature. It is more to be lamented than wondered at that sincere Christians are sometimes forced to confess he is a good man and his prayers as to their substance are spiritual and judicious. But there's something so displeasing in his manner that I am always uneasy when I hear him pray. And I'm sure you have heard men that when they say, let us pray, they launch into a tone, a quality in their voice that is different from their ordinary speaking voice. Sometimes it has to do with ecclesiastical associations. Some of us have experienced this in certain regions of the UK. You go up in the highlands in some of the more remote areas and there's kind of a highland vibrato and when a man prays and some when they preach, it's a totally different voice from that mortal who would be sitting at a table having a cup of coffee with you. A totally different tone. And then there are other circles, and I don't want to embarrass uh, people who might uh, hear what I am saying, but uh, they, they take on a very, very super pious tone, a very grave tone, our Father. And it's not the way normal mortals talk. It's a special praying voice. And my word of exhortation is avoid like the plague, assuming a praying voice. But then secondly, avoid monotone. We usually associate monotone with someone who is unanimated and gets down at a lower tone and their voice sounds something like the computer voice that you hear when you're on the train in an airport and it says stay in the car till we come to Terminal C. But the monotone can be up here as well. Monotone means you're staying at the same pitch. And again, that's not normal for ordinary human speech. 
is I'm just talking to you now. I'm going up, I'm coming down, I am pausing, all of those things. There should be nothing fundamentally different if someone were to take a voice print of your voice sitting at a table talking to a group of people, a context of public speaking, they ought to be able to record your prayers before the people of God and in the presence of God, compare the voice prints and say there is no fundamental difference. They match. There is a naturalness. And with that, most people don't talk in their interactions with others in a monotone but some, for whatever reason, when they begin to lead in public prayer, move into, if not a full monotone, there is much less fluctuation in the voice than in normal conversation. But then thirdly, and I know this applies to some of you here, and I have had to work on this myself, avoid overly sustained intensity usually indicated by moving the voice to a higher register and with greater volume. And we must avoid that if God is giving us, given us a more intense, volatile temperament that when we're talking about a sporting event or when we're talking about some humorous incident with our children, anything of that nature. We talk with our hands, our voices begin intense, the volume can come up. Well, when we pray, it's to be expected that those elements of our humanity will be overlaid upon our vocal patterns. However, we can be vulnerable to an overly sustained intensity. And I've been in situations where when the brother was praying and I've tried to track with him I've gotten worn out and I've wanted to say, brother, you've left me. I mean, I need to pause and get my breath. So we need to beware then in the vocal patterns of our praying, avoiding sustained intensity, usually indicated by the voice moving up into a higher register and with greater volume. Then fourthly, avoid indistinctness of speech and insufficient volume. Always remember, in the assembly of God's people, any kind of utterance of words, here is God's guideline for us. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 9. So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air, not into the ears and the understanding and the affections and the hearts of people. You'll just be bumping air molecules around the auditorium. That's all you'll be doing. Unless you utter by the tongue speech easy to be understood. And what's essential for speech to be easily understood, well, first of all, obvious, it must be in a common language. Some of you here speak Spanish, and if you began to communicate in Spanish, we'd say, oh, that's a lovely, mellifluous language, but you could be cursing us, and we'd think you were blessing us. Some speak Korean. We'd have no understanding. If speech is to be easily understood, it must be a common language and here's the little fine print. With the use of a range of vocabulary suitable to the average person in the pew. We aim at the mean. There may be some PhDs with a very expansive vocabulary. We could never out-vocabulary them. We could use our richest, fullest, most advanced vocabulary. They track with us every single word. Then there are others who are very deficient. We don't need to accommodate ourselves to the lowest strata because part of our ministry in every part of our oral discourse in the church is seeking to elevate people. We don't dumb down, but we accommodate in a way that our speech will ordinarily be easy to understand. So that involves 
a common language with a range of vocabulary that the average person is comfortable with. But then secondly, it involves distinctness of articulation and accuracy of pronunciation. Consonants are consonants. Vowels are vowels. And the consonants should be pronounced, and in public discourse, we have to learn to pronounce them in a way that may sound to us a little bit exaggerated if we've not been trained in one way or another to speak the consonants clearly. Now, for me, personally, having a mother who had profound hearing loss all of her life from the time she was 16, I was reared in a home where if you looked right at my mother and you pronounced your words properly, giving due weight to all the vowels and all the consonants, you didn't have to holler at her. But if you talked on your throat like a ventriloquist and didn't move your lips and didn't clearly pronounce your consonants and your vowels, my poor mother would not have a clue what you're saying. And I think there are some preachers who've gone to ventriloquist school because their lips don't move, they don't pronounce their... <laughs> I've practiced in front of the mirror. <laughs> I put it this way, very simply. The Average man, speaking as he ought, will spit when he speaks because he's using his teeth. You can't say teeth properly, T teeth, without some saliva getting activated. And if you're going to speak, then you're going to explode your peas. And brethren, it may sound silly, but it's not silly, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. And if words piggyback one another because they are not separated by pronouncing all of the consonants and all of the vowels, then there are going to be those who do not understand all that we are saying. As vibrations come out of the larynx, and air molecules are bumped, those waves tend to flatten out the further they go out. And one of my gripes is most of you men had the curse of getting dependent upon voice assistance with a microphone and speakers long before you ever should have, so that you've never fully cultivated your vocal powers. You don't know how to roar in such a way that is not oppressive, and how to give a stage whisper that carries to the back row. So you've been dependent on this little finger, this black finger or something hooked on, and really it's a shame. And when you read the old writers on the cultivation of the voice, they're all assuming if you don't fill the auditorium with your voice, nobody else is going to. And men learned how to use their vocal powers. I'm just rereading now Spurgeon's uh, four-volume, the complete autobiography. And when I read of this guy as an 18-year-old kid preaching to thousands with no voice assist and yet not grating on people with an overly strident voice, uh, when you read what they said, now God gave him an unusual endowment right in here. Granted, and we can't imitate that or reproduce that. But we can do the best with what we've got. And you've got teeth and tongue and the ability to pronounce the consonants and to give full weight to the vowels. This is the cardinal issue, not the cardinal issue, the cardinal issue, the card now issue, the cardinal issue, not the cardinal. You don't swallow the consonants and the vowels. You give them their full weight, and it's first, for some of you, that may seem a bit strange. But after a while, it'll be as natural as breathing. So if we're going to utter words, easy to be understood, there must be a common language with a range of vocabulary suitable to the common man, 
Secondly, there must be sufficient distinctness of enunciation and pronunciation. And then, obviously, there must be sufficient volume. And I would urge you, if you can at all, use your mic for recording if that's appropriate. But if you're not preaching to more than 50 to 100 people, I would urge you to take the plunge and try to cultivate your vocal faculties without the assistance of a microphone and speakers. But whether you take that counsel or not, surely speak distinctly, clearly, so that your words will be easy to understand. Then, number five, avoid praying with your face down toward the pulpit. Now, this was not in your lectures when you were a student, nor yours. But since my dramatic hearing loss, even with the help of my cochlear implant and my advanced hearing aid, many times when I'm in a church service, I need to look up at the pastor or whoever is praying in order to supplement what I hear with my electronic ears with what I see as I read lips. And it's so frustrating when a man is praying down this way and I can't read his lips. It's one of the things, Dave, I've been thankful for when we've taken in some of the live services here. For the most part, you pray with your face right up and I'm able to read your lips and I'm thankful for that. And I would urge you men, most of you will have at least a few people who are older in age and have what's called medically presbyacusis. Presby, presbyter, old man. Acoustics. That's old age hearing loss. They have a marginal hearing loss. Some of them will not. They're stubborn old goats. They won't get hearing aids. They don't think they need them. Everybody just talks too soft. That's everybody's the problem. Well, that's reality and that's human nature. But you see, if you will keep your face up, they will be able to be helped by that simple little aspect of your consideration of them. Remember Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, as you would that others do unto you, even so do ye also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets, that they may come when you're going to have electronic ears. Or you may be too proud to get electronic ears and you're constantly going to be saying, huh, what's that? Can you repeat it? And you're going to seek to worship and enter into the prayers as you would that others do unto you. You want a man of God who lifts his face up so you can read his lips when he prays? You do that for the person who's there now. So, those are my five simple avoid counsels with regard to the use of our vocal powers. Then in the fifth place, I want to set before you some guidelines with respect to the length of our public prayers. To answer the question, how long should one pray in any given public prayer, demands a multifaceted sensitivity to many variables. Like the answer to the question, how long should one preach? There is no one size fits all. There is no one size that fits one all the time. No one size fits all. No one size fits one all the time. You understand my little turn of phrase? Okay. Some of the variables that must be considered in seeking to give a responsible answer to this question are such things as the pastor's own present spiritual, emotional, and mental state, the precise relationship which the pastor sustains to his people, the pastor's own knowledge of his people, the present spiritual condition of the congregation, and the measure and present cultivation of a pastor's gift of public prayer. These are just some of the variables. So when we're wrestling with this matter, how long shall I pray in my invocation? 
How many of the attributes of God shall I single out and praise God for that he is this and that in himself and to his people? How long shall I pray in what we normally would call a pastoral, congregational, intercessory prayer? How many subjects should be covered? There are all kinds of issues to be wrestled with. And just as there are factors in the man who leads in prayer that must be considered in determining an appropriate length of his prayer, there are factors present in the congregation which should materially influence a responsible answer to this vexing question. How spiritually mature is the congregation? How long have the majority been accustomed to a substantive pastoral prayer that has structure to it and has development and transition? Just like coming into a church where people have not been accustomed to close, responsible, consecutive exposition, they've not been trained to follow a line of biblical argument, I don't care if you had Lloyd-Jones or Spurgeon coming into such a people, people couldn't take an hour's exposition. You've got to take people where they are and lead them onward, not accommodate and freeze in the framework of your accommodation, but meet them where they are. Isn't that biblical? The writer to Hebrews. i got lots of things I want to tell you about Melchizedek. You ain't ready to take them. Can't take them. The Lord Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you. You are not yet able to bear them. Well, likewise then, there are some congregations where a man with the spirit of prayer resting upon him, with a well-prepared, well-structured prayer, and with present aid of the Holy Spirit, can pray for 10 or 15 minutes to the blessing of everyone gathered. There are some settings where anything more than five minutes would not be insufferable, but it would be very difficult for the people to follow and to enter in with the servant of God. So in the light of this, I offer two simple words of counsel. Number one, avoid being too long. Assume, assume that your greater danger is to be too long than too short and seek to avoid being too long. Listen to Spurgeon. He's got his students gathered in front of him on a Friday afternoon, and he says to them, by way of a negative canon rule, I should say, do not let your prayer be long. I think it was John MacDonald who used to say, quote, if you are in the spirit of prayer, do not be long, because other people will not be able to keep pace with you in such unusual spirituality. And if you are not in the spirit of prayer, don't be long, because you will be sure then to weary the listeners. Livingstone says of Robert Bruce of Edinburgh, the famous co-temporary of Andrew Melville, quote, No man in his time spoke with such evidence and power of the Spirit. No man had so many seals of conversion. Yea, many of his hearers thought no man since the apostles spake with such power. He was very short in prayer when others were present, but every sentence was like a strong bolt shot up to heaven. I have heard him say that he wearied when others were long in prayer, but being alone, he spent much time wrestling and prayer. A man may, on special occasions, if he be unusually moved and carried out of himself, pray for 20 minutes in the long morning prayer, but this should not often happen. My friend, Dr. Charles Brown of Edinburgh, lays it down as a result of his deliberate judgment that 10 minutes is the limit to which public prayer ought to be prolonged. Our puritanic forefathers used to pray for three quarters of an hour or more, but you must recollect they did not know whether they'd ever have the opportunity of praying again before an assembly and therefore took their fill of it. This may be the last time I'll gather with my people before the authorities disperse us and throw us in jail or kick us out of town. 
So we're going to gobble up the opportunity while it is before us. Besides, people were not inclined in those days to quarrel with the length of prayers or of sermons so much as they do nowadays. Virgin writing toward the end of the 19th century, people were complaining. Imagine what he'd say were we living today. You cannot pray too long in private. We do not limit you to 10 minutes there or 10 hours or 10 weeks if you like. The more you are on your knees alone, the better. We are now speaking of those public prayers which come before or after the sermon, and for these 10 minutes is a better limit than 15. Only one in a thousand would complain of you for being too short, while scores will murmur at your being wearisome in length. One said he prayed me into a good frame, Whitfield once said of a certain preacher, and if he'd stopped there, it would have been very well, but he prayed me out of it again by keeping on. The abundant long-suffering of God has been exemplified in his sparing some preachers who have been great sinners in this direction and have done much injury to the piety of God's people by their long-winded orations. And yet God in his mercy has permitted them still to officiate in the sanctuary. Alas, for those who have to listen to pastors who pray in public for five and twenty minutes and then ask God to forgive them for their shortcomings. <laughs> Typical Spurgeon. Well, Spurgeon was not the only one to give this exhortation, avoid being too long, for we have from Blakey, this very sagacious word of counsel. It may be useful with equal brevity to advert to some of the most common faults in public prayer. One of these is excessive length. Nothing is more clearly shown by experience than the impossibility of continuing to join heartily in very long prayers for people to throw themselves into the current of another man's devotions involves a great mental effort, and in proportion to the greatness of the effort is their liability to fatigue. So very helpful insight. If your people are really engaging, and you have said, now let us seek to engage mind and heart and the whole of our redeemed humanity, and the true people of God say, yes, Lord, help me. He's saying to track mentally and emotionally with another is an arduous task. It's quite certain that attention cannot be given beyond a certain point, and when attention fails, devotion Ends. And then he quotes, apparently a well-known incident from Whitfield's life. But if it be the case that from five to ten minutes is the longest period during which the average capacity of a congregation can join in prayer, let him accommodate himself to their capacity. And if more time for prayer should deem necessary, let him rather increase the number of prayers than lengthen out any to an undue degree. Very wise, very helpful counsel. So that's my first word of counsel regarding the length of our prayers. Avoid being too long. Secondly, Avoid a consistently predictable length to your public prayers. And you have a quote from Spurgeon that again is very, very helpful. He says, vary the length of your public prayers. Do you not think it would be much better if sometimes instead of giving three minutes to the first prayer, 15 minutes to the second, you gave nine minutes to each? Would it not be better sometime to be longer in the first and not so long in the second prayer? Would not two prayers of tolerable length be better than one extremely long and one extremely short? Would it not be as well to have a hymn after reading the chapter or a verse or two before the prayer? 
Why not sing four times occasionally? Well, some of you sing four times regularly. Why not be content with two hymns or only one occasionally? Why sing after the sermon? Why, on the other hand, do some never sing at the close of the service? Is a prayer after sermon always or even often advisable? Is it not sometime most impressive? Would not the Holy Spirit's guidance secure us a variety at present unknown? Let us have anything so that our people do not come to regard any form of service as being appointed and so relapse into the superstition from which they have escaped. Vary the length of your prayers. Think through the issues and respond accordingly. Now I conclude this part of the lecture by addressing one more but very vital aspect relative to that which I have called general guidelines for our public prayers. It has to do with what I have chosen to call in the sixth place general guidelines with respect to the spiritual life and energy of our public prayers. With respect to this aspect which is so vital to our public prayers and our efforts to be an effective mouthpiece to God on behalf of the people, I give you three words of counsel. Number one, be convinced of the necessity and availability of the help of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with our public praying. Be convinced of the necessity and also availability of the help of the Spirit in this discipline. And I've given you those four texts. Paul says, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with perseverance for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 19. Then the well-known text of Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our infirmity. What infirmity? We know not how to pray as we ought and then Jude 20, but you, building up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And then that marvelous promise in Zechariah 12:10, I will pour out upon the house of David the spirit of grace and of supplication. God has made it plain that there is a distinctive ministry of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the act of praying. And brethren, as surely as in our preparation for preaching, we plead for the Spirit's help in the study. We plead that the Spirit will come down upon us that we may preach not in word only, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. We need specifically, explicitly to plead with God. This is number two. Cry to God for the special aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with your public prayers. Not only be convinced of the necessity and availability of that help, but cry to God that it may be given. You ought to wear Luke eleven thirteen out. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And could it be that some of our vapid, dull, passionless prayers are because God's saying to you and to me, you have not because you ask not. Ask! And it shall be given you. Who knows what new dimensions of effectiveness in public prayer would be our portion if convinced of the necessity and availability of the Spirit's help, we earnestly cry to God that we might experience that help. And then thirdly, seek to cultivate an attitude of conscious prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit prior to 
and even in the midst of your public prayers. You begin to pray and you sense that you can't bust loose from earth. You're seeking with all your heart to have a sense, I'm engaging God, but I feel tethered to my own dullness, my own lack of seeing spiritual realities in sharp and bold relief. And in the midst of your praying, you're lifting up your heart, oh God, help, Holy Spirit, come, cut me loose from earth, let me soar. An attitude that even in the act of praying, as I hope you've cultivated with your preaching, when you come in those places where, to use Spurgeon's analogy, you feel like you're one of Pharaoh's chariots in the Red Sea, where they got stuck in the mud up to the axles. And here you've prepared and you felt you had a word for God's people, but when you're driving that chariot, it's stuck in the mud. What do you do? Your heart is lifted up. Lord, help. Get me out of this mess. Come by the Spirit. Well, we need to do the same thing with our prayers, brethren. Cultivate an attitude of conscious, prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit prior to and even in the midst of our praying. Remember Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like a heath in the desert and God describes his utter barrenness and fruitlessness as God's curse upon his creature confidence. Having taken to heart the exhortations of these lectures, you say, I'm going to work more on organizing my prayers, thinking, thinking through my prayers, seeing the scriptures that I want included in my prayers. Bless God if you do it, but don't stop there and begin to trust your preparation. God will curse you with spiritual barrenness. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Well, having introduced this vital subject, Having set before you some general guidelines, six categories of them, we come now in our third major heading to consider what I'm calling so the cultivate, I'm sorry, some concluding practical suggestions with respect to our cultivating the gift of public prayer. These are practical suggestions, brethren, things, this is the how-to part of the lecture. Number one. If you are not doing this already, seek to establish the habit of praying in the Scriptures. Now by that I simply mean that in your devotional reading of the Word of God, whatever you read that can be turned into fuel for prayer, pray it back to God using the language of the text of Scripture. And when you do that, you will be memorizing far more scripture than you had any idea you had memorized. By praying it in and praying it out and praying it up, you'll be in the midst of pastoral prayer and out of your mouth will come things that, well, that's what I read last week. You're not even aware that it had been tucked away in the folds of the mind. But the same Spirit who caused that word to precipitate prayer in the secret place has, as it were, helped you to store it up in the chambers of the mind and heart. And that Spirit comes upon you as you pray, and out comes the word. I quote Gabney at this point, again so helpful. Above all, above all, should the minister enrich his prayers with the language of Scripture. Not everything in the Scripture is appropriate to express devotion, as some pedantic minds seem to imagine, but the language of its spiritual and devotional parts. Besides, its inimitable beauty and simplicity, it is hallowed and sweet to every pious heart by a thousand associations, it satisfies the taste of all, that is, scriptural language. Its use effectually protects us against improprieties. It was doubtless given by the Holy Spirit to be a model for our devotions. Let it then abound in our prayers. 
the young minister should store his memory richly with these noble strains fixing in his mind the very words of the English version. He should memorize perfectly the finest passages from the Psalms, the prophets and evangelists and apostles and study them to make them apt vehicles of his worship. As you pray in the scriptures, you will be furnishing your mind and heart with the stuff that will give a scriptural flavor to your prayers. Secondly, practical counsel, establish the practice of preparing the framework or outline for your public prayers. Mentally at least, perhaps to help in the discipline even putting down key words in a written outline that you carry with you into the pulpit. Go over it before your prayer in the morning of the Lord's Day. Put it there in the pulpit. God is not insulted if you open your eyes to make sure your prayer brings optimum edification. You will not be profaning prayer to open your eyes and say, oh, I almost forgot that third concern. And that would not have been appropriate to omit that. So I would urge you to consider establishing the practice of preparing the framework or outline for your public prayers. Listen to Shedd's counsel. First, he, the pastor, ought to study method in prayer and observe it. A prayer should have a plan as much as a sermon. Would you ever think of standing up to preach a sermon that had no beginning, middle, and end? I hope not whether you have firstly, secondly, thirdly, stated as such is irrelevant. But that there is a plan, that there is logical connection and discernible transition from one focus of thought to another is absolutely essential to any kind of oral discourse. A prayer should have a plan as much as a sermon. In the recoil from the formalism of written and read prayers, Protestants have not paid sufficient attention to an orderly and symmetrical structure in public supplications. Extemporaneous prayer, like extemporaneous preaching, is too often the product of the single instant instead of devout reflection and premeditation. It might at first glance seem that Premeditation and supplication are incongruous conceptions. That prayer must be a gush of feeling without distinct reflection. This is an error. No man, no creature can pray well without knowing what he's praying for and whom he is praying to. Everything in prayer and especially in public prayer ought to be well considered and well weighed. Establish the practice of preparing the framework or an outline for your public prayers. Third word of counsel, establish the general practice of joining your own public prayers with your preaching and leading the worship of God. When I first read this in Spurgeon, I didn't quite understand it. But the longer I was in pastoral ministry, I understood it more and more. And not only understood it, I came to share his conviction. Spurgeon writes on this point, as a rule, if called upon to preach, conduct the prayer yourself. And if you should be highly esteemed in the ministry, as I trust you may be, make a point with great courtesy but equal firmness to resist the practice of choosing men to pray with the idea of honoring them by giving them something to do. Our public devotions ought never to be degraded into opportunities for compliment. I've heard prayer and singing now and then called preliminary services, as if they were but a preface to the sermon. This is rare, I hope, among us. And I say, amen. I don't hear that terminology among us. If it were common, it would be to our deep disgrace. 
I endeavor invariably to take all the service myself for my own sake, and I think also for the people's. I do not believe that anybody will do for the praying. No, sirs. It is my solemn conviction that the prayer is one of the most weighty, useful, and honorable parts of the service, and that it ought to be even more considered than the sermon. There must be no putting up of anybody's and nobody's to pray, and then the skeleton of the abler man to preach. It may happen through weakness or upon a special occasion that it may be a relief to the minister to have someone to offer prayer for him. But if the Lord has made you love your work, you will not often or readily fulfill this part of it by proxy. If you delegate the service at all, let it be to one in whose spirituality and present preparedness you have the fullest confidence. But to pitch on a giftless brother unawares and put him forward to get through the devotions is shamely. I'm sorry, shameful. Appoint the ablest man to pray and let the sermon be slurred sooner than the approach to heaven. Let the infinite Jehovah be served with our best. Let prayer addressed to the divine majesty be carefully weighed and presented with all the powers of an awakened heart and spiritual understanding. I come then to the last sentence in that paragraph. I will sooner yield up the sermon than the prayer. Thus much I have said in order to impress upon you that you must highly esteem public prayer and seek of the Lord for the gifts and graces necessary to its right discharge. Now obviously those sentiments need to be qualified where God is pleased to give an assembly more than one man with a modicum of gifts of utterance in public prayer. Obviously. If God's endowed two, three, four men in a given assembly, put them in places of leadership, and they have a cultivated gift of public prayer, then that gift should be exercised. Spurgeon is talking from the standpoint of his own perspective in terms of his strategic, unique place of leadership. And he had the experience of going as a guest preacher, and at the last minute people say, well, Brother so-and-so has showed up here from this particular place. Uh, why don't we have him come and take the prayer? That's what he's going after and saying that should never be. That's just showing kindness and deference to recognize a beloved brother. It's not securing the optimum edification of the people of God. So my counsel is, if you're not yet doing it, pray in the scriptures. Secondly, establish the practice of preparing the framework or outline for your public prayers. Establish the general practice of joining your own prayers when you preach, and fourthly, seek to establish a framework for receiving constructive criticism and counsel concerning your public prayers, preferably your fellow elders and any mature, discerning men and women in the church should qualify for this responsibility. As you get to know your people, you say, well, Brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is spiritually minded, discerning, honest, secure in their relationship to me and I to them, knowing if I ask them, be honest with me. Do you think my prayers are too long that they're going to be honest with me, knowing that they are not disrespecting me by being honest? And that you're man enough not to wither when they tell you, well, to be honest, Pastor, you just go on two or three minutes too long. I'm tracking with you regularly, but it's that extra two to three minutes you lose me. Because public prayer is like preaching. When you preach beyond the measure of your gift and beyond the measure of the people's capacity, they remember that extra five or ten minutes and it neutralizes much of the wholesome effect of the previous time. 
It's like sitting at a table and you've had a wonderful meal and you lean back and you're ready for a good burp. And your host or your hostess almost forces another portion on you. And finally, just to make sure you don't offend them, you plop it on your plate and you choke it down. When you leave that table, what do you remember? You almost forget the enjoyable meal that led up to that forced second portion. Same is true spiritually. When someone is leading you in prayer and with them you've tracked into the consciousness of engaging God, there's been delight in adoration and worship, there's been earnestness in supplication, and just at the point where, and this is what will often happen, a man just can't get the thing down out of 30,000 on the runway and park it at the gate. He just somehow's got a problem. And so even in his language, and then, Father, finally we pray for, and then he goes on, and then he goes on. We ought to desperately seek to avoid that pattern. And one thing that will help is establish a framework for receiving constructive criticism and counsel concerning your public prayers. Well, I bring the lecture to a conclusion, and I can think of no better way to conclude this lecture than to read the brief paragraph with which Spurgeon concluded his treatment of this subject in the lectures that he gave to his students. And this was Spurgeon's final word. Let your prayers be earnest, full of fire, vehemence, prevalence. I pray the Holy Ghost to instruct every student of this college so, that to, so to offer public prayer that God shall always be served of his best. Let your petitions be plain and heartfelt. And while your people may sometimes feel that the sermon was below the mark, may they also feel that the prayer compensated for all. What a noble standard to have. May God help us, my brethren, that we will, with the Lord's grace and strength, continue to cultivate our gift of public prayer to the enrichment of God's people and to the profit of our own souls. Let's pray together. Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bless you and we thank you for the privilege of prayer to think that we poor, weak creatures of the dust sinners from our very conception, that because of your beloved Son and the work accomplished for our redemption and because of the indwelling of the person of the Holy Spirit, we are both privileged to address you as our Father and privileged to experience divine help in coming to you upon a throne of grace. We asked for your help at the beginning of this hour, and you have graciously answered us. You have helped me after all these hours to think clearly and to be able to put into words the track laid by my thoughts. Lord, this is your doing. Left to ourselves, we stutter and we mumble and we mix it all up. We thank you for your help. Thank you for my dear brothers who have sat and attentively, attentively drawn out of me what I have sought to prepare to set before them. We are deeply grateful and pray once more, Lord, seal to our hearts everything that has been true to your word and blow away the chaff of all else. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.